Good morning. It's a joy to be here, isn't it? A joy to be here, um, brothers and sisters, uh, as we spend time now um, continuing our journey through Mark's Gospel. Some of you will have heard this before, perhaps more than some of you, maybe most of you have heard this before, but a well-known sort of Christian saying, I think that Billy Graham used, but it probably predates Billy Graham um, in his meetings, was this. Um, if I was put on trial for following Jesus, would there be enough evidence to convict me of being a Christian? I, would the way that I have lived my life be truly Christ-like? In my actions, in my words, in my attitudes and in my character. Last week, we considered Jesus' betrayal and Jesus' arrest. And as Dave said, this week we're going to consider one part, I'll explain a bit later, but one part of Jesus' trial before the Jewish authorities. We often think, don't we, when... We picture what Jesus has done for us. I know I do, certainly. We think about his death on the cross and what he suffered and the agony he went through for you and for me, for my sin, for your sin. He became sin for us. He died in our place that we might be forgiven. His blood was shed for us. And yes, he rose on the third day, but he went through that agony before the glory of the resurrection. Perhaps something we think of a little bit less, that's perhaps me, of what he went through at his trial. Jesus endured the false accusations, the mocking, the beating, the spitting upon for me and for you. Jesus, perfect humanity, fully God, fully man, sinless, good, righteous, the truth the Christ, God's chosen ruler and king, and all the evidence of his earthly life overwhelmingly affirm the truth of who Jesus is. Yet at his trial, the authorities were not interested in hearing the truth, upholding the truth, wanting a truthful verdict. They sought instead to falsely accuse Jesus and that's what they did, of sin and of blasphemy, desiring his death. What a travesty of justice, in averting commas. One of the sayings that we use in our vocabulary, we often perhaps might hear this sometimes regarding a trial that has a significant verdict, a landmark ruling, grave consequences. It was the trial, the trial of the century, but when we consider Jesus' trial, how might we describe this? The verdict led to a perfectly innocent man being put to death. It was a complete miscarriage of justice. But it was in God's sovereign plan to save sinful men, sinful women, to save you and me. The ruling that came from the verdict of the trial was a ruling that came from jealousy, from hatred, from the rejection of Jesus by the Jewish religious authorities, their sin. But it was my sin also that held him there until it was accomplished. His dying breath, as we say in the song, has brought me life. I know that it is finished. It was man's greatest act of evil, let's put it like that. Put it to death, God the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. But it was God's greatest act of love, for God so loved the world. And the consequences, well, the consequences are wonderful. The grave ultimately defeated, sin defeated, death defeated, hell and Satan defeated, hallelujah, by our Lord Jesus Christ, because he died and he rose and he is alive forevermore. How could we describe the trial that preceded that other than the trial of eternity? Jesus actually endured two trials. 
And each had three hearings. First trials before the Jewish authorities, which we're going to read in a moment. They had responsibility for religious matters, but they couldn't put anyone to death. And Jesus' second trial was before the Roman authorities, responsible for civil matters, but had the authority to put someone to death. But although they had that authority, it was only authority that God had given to them. Particularly thinking about Jesus and his words to Pilate in John's Gospel, you would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given to you from above. I have the authority, Jesus said before his death, to lay down my life, to take it up again. It has been given to me. Jesus has all authority. But that authority was given to Pilate in that final verdict that led to Jesus' death. If we wanted a complete chronology of these two trials with the three hearings in each of Jesus, we've got to read all four Gospels. But this morning we're going to pick up, as I said, our reading from Mark chapter 14. We're going to read from verses 53 to 65. Janice, if you're able to pop that up, please. Thank you. This is actually the second hearing of Jesus' first trial before the Jewish authorities. If you wanted to read the first hearing of Jesus' first trial, you need to turn to John chapter 18 and read verses 12 through to 14 and 19 through to 23. And this is where Jesus was, in a sense, informally questioned by Annas, who was the former high priest, but he was the current high priest who was Caiaphas' father-in-law. A thought is this. Possibly he appeared before Annas in that first part, or that first hearing of his first trial, to give time for the members of the Sanhedrin, the Jewish council, to hastily come together for the formal, in inverted commas, trial that we're going to read about in a minute, but a legal trial, the account of which we're now going to read. And so starting at verse 53... Mark 14. And they led Jesus to the high priest. And all the chief priests and the elders and the scribes came together. And Peter had followed him at a distance, right into the courtyard of the high priest. And he was sitting with the guards and warming himself at the fire. Now the chief priests and the whole council were seeking testimony against Jesus to put him to death, but they found none. For many bore false witness against him, but their testimony did not agree. And some stood up and bore false witness against him, saying, We heard him say, I will destroy this temple that is made with hands, and in three days I will build another not made with hands. Yet even about this, their testimony did not agree. And the high priest stood up in the midst and asked Jesus, Have you no answer to make? What is it that these men testify against you? But he remained silent and made no answer. Again, the high priest asked him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? And Jesus said, I am. And you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. And the high priest tore his garments and said, What further witnesses do we need? You have heard this blasphemy. What is your decision? And they all condemned him as deserving death. And some began to spit on him and to cover his face and to strike him, saying to him, Prophesy. And the guards received him with blows. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. Very sobering passage of scripture. I just want to think about this trial. Why was it illegal? Why was it a false trial? Well, As I've studied this, come to seven 
readings or reasons, I beg your pardon, which I will share with you. Um, the way that the council should have conducted themselves in a trial situation um, is not laid down in the word of God that we have before us, but it's certainly there in the Jewish oral laws and tradition. It's called the Mishnah. And these are the seven reasons why this trial, so-called trial, was illegal. Firstly, the place that they met, actually reading this, it's the high priest's residence. It was not their official place of meeting. They were supposed to meet in what was known as the Hall of Hewn Stone in the temporal sea precincts. And that any decisions they made were therefore not valid unless they were taken at that official place of meeting. Secondly, they were not allowed to meet at night. But Jesus is being tried, isn't he? in the middle of the night. Thirdly, they were not allowed to meet at any of the great feasts. What feast are they meeting at? The feast of Passover. Fourthly, witnesses had to be examined separately. And for a valid verdict to be decided upon, two or three witnesses had to be in agreement if a conviction was to be be sought. The evidence had to agree, but it doesn't, as we'll explore a little bit more in a minute. That was something that is prescribed in Scripture. God's law, Deuteronomy 17, verse 6, talks about two or three witnesses being required. And 1915, also Deuteronomy, two to three witnesses must be required. And that second passage of Scripture actually says that if a witness was a malicious witness and gave false testimony, and that was found out, then the sentence that was desired by the malicious witness would actually fall upon them rather than upon the person who they were falsely accusing. Fifthly, every member of the council, the Jewish Sanhedrin, had to give their verdict separately. They don't. It's a mass decision, it would seem, from the scriptures we've read at the end. And if the verdict they gave was a verdict that the person desired death, then a whole night was required to pass before the sentence was carried out to allow for clemency, to allow for the court to have a change of decision and to grant mercy. Again, this is not something that in any way, shape or form happened. Jesus was tried during the night and he was on the cross by nine o'clock the next day. Finally, seventh, the high priest was not uh, permitted to ask leading questions. And what does he do? He asks Jesus directly. His second question is a leading question if he is the Messiah seeking to incriminate him. And so this is a false trial, an illegal hearing. But God permitted it. God was sovereign over all of it. And Jesus the willingly and obediently allowed himself to endure it. For me and for you. So what can we learn as we look a little bit more detailed into this passage of Scripture? Well, in verses 55 and 56, we read that uh, they sought testimony against Jesus to put him to death. Witnesses came forward, false witnesses. And there are a number of unspecified charges. We don't know what they were. They're not named. It says they sought testimony, but they found none. Many bore false witness against him, but their testimony did not agree. And so we don't know what those accusations were. We've already studied, haven't we? We've already thought that Jesus is perfectly innocent, sinless. He did nothing wrong so that no one could stand up and present a case against Jesus that would have been a case that would have held water, that could have accused him of wrongdoing or of sin. These were false witnesses. But just a thought that comes is, if... Sincere witnesses had been called forward to speak the truth about Jesus. What might they have said? Maybe the person who was listening to the Sermon on the Mount would have said, Jesus spoke 
and talked like no other man. He spoke with true authority. Maybe the blind man who Jesus spat upon his hands and touched his eyes, who initially saw trees walking, and then Jesus did it again, and his sight became clear. He would have said, Jesus restored my sight. The lame man who was there at the pool of Bethesda who had been lame for 38 years. Jesus enabled me to walk. The sick lady who had the discharge of blood who crept up to Jesus and touched his robes, not wanting to be discovered, but then knew healing from her sickness. Jesus healed me of my sickness. What about the lepers who no one would touch? But Jesus touched them. Jesus renewed our bodies. What about the man who lived among the tombs, a demonized man, the Gerasene demoniac, who Jesus spoke a word and delivered him from bondage to Satan. Jesus delivered me and gave me back my life. What about the members of the hungry crowd of the 5,000 who needed food? Jesus provided us food to feed us. What about Lazarus? I was in the grave for four days. But Jesus spoke a word and raised me back to life. Brothers and sisters, what would your testimony, what would my testimony be if we were to give evidence as to what Jesus has done for us, for you, and for me? He's brought me out of darkness and brought me into life. He's brought me from being dead and made me alive. He's forgiven me my sin. He's given me the gift of eternal life. He's put a joy and a love and a peace and assurance in my heart that can be found nowhere but through faith in Jesus. He's healed me in so many ways. And he's with me on every step of the journey. But then we move on in verses 57 through to 59. The named charge now, which also didn't stand up. What do they say? Those who stood up and made this charge. We heard him say, I will destroy this temple that is made with hands, and in three days I will build another not made with hands. But their testimony did not agree. They're misquoting. They've embellished, they've taken out of context Jesus' words, the words he actually spoke, which are recorded for us in John chapter 2, verse 19, where Jesus actually said, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Talking about the temple of his body, talking about his death, talking about his resurrection. But they're thinking about the actual physical temple and seeking to put a false charge upon Jesus that in some way he will destroy it, the place that was the place of worship. They've taken the truth and made it into a half-truth. And in telling that half-truth, it became untruth. I'm not suggesting that any of us would stand up in that sort of way, but something that comes to mind that we need to guard against ourselves is against, as it were, telling half-truths. Perhaps I can put it in a slightly different way. We can hear things that people might share or say with us. If that's said in confidence, then we must choose not to share that with others. But the temptation can be, and it's for all of us, and if we're honest, we all know this is here, is that we can seek to perhaps gossip and spread what has been told us and pass that on to others. We have to ask the Lord to put a seal on our lips to stop us from doing that, because that is sin. If we do that, it is sin. We have the power of life and death in the tongue. That's what we're told in the scriptures. And so we need to ask the Lord to give us wisdom when we hear things 
as to how we might share that. Is there a need to share that? And there are three is it statements that are extremely useful as a guide. If we've heard something, is it truthful? If we're going to share that or say, in a sense, or if we're going to say it to somebody else, is it truthful? Is it loving? Is it coming from the right attitude of heart? But is it necessary? Is it truthful? Is it loving? Is it necessary? So we just need to put a guard on what we say and speak the truth when we speak it in love. And so we move on. The false witnesses, their testimonies have been proven invalid. And so the high priest himself now intervenes. Verses 60 through to the first part of verse 61. But he, that's Jesus, remained silent and made no answer. Sorry, I beg your pardon. Verse 60. And the high priest stood up in the midst and asked Jesus, Have you no answer to make? What is it that these men testify against you? But he remained silent and he made no answer. In remaining silent, Jesus is actually fulfilling prophecy. One of the verses we looked at last week in Mark 14, Mark 14, 49, Jesus said at the time of his betrayal and his arrest, but let the scriptures be fulfilled. And so what's happening here in this trial situation of Jesus is that there's actually a fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. Because we think, don't we, of Isaiah 53, verse 7. What does the scripture say? This is written about 700 years before Jesus actually was born and stepped down from heaven and took on flesh. He, that's Jesus, was oppressed, he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. That was prophesied. Jesus fulfills that prophecy. He didn't speak. He entrusted himself to his father's care and righteous judgment. We could read in the New Testament, 1 Peter 2, 23, when Jesus was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but he continued to entrust himself to him who judges justly. He trusted himself into his Father's care. And that is a wonderful example for us, brothers and sisters, that when we perhaps feel under pressure, when we're feeling threatened, we need to entrust ourselves too to Jesus's care into Jesus' hands and entrust him to work out what is right through that situation. We don't want to take revenge. We don't want to speak out in an angry way. The Lord says, vengeance is mine in Deuteronomy and again in Romans. I will repay. It's so easy to say it, but not easy to do it. Lord, please grant us the yeah, the ability to trust you, that could be our prayer. In all the situations I find myself in life, to look to you, to lead and guide me through, to trust you with all my heart, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, and lean not on my own understanding, to acknowledge you in all I do, knowing that you will make my pathway straight. There were many prophecies that were fulfilled at Jesus' first coming and going through to his death on the cross. Another one I read this week, I'd never come across this and seen it in this light before, Psalm 38, verses 19 and 20. This is a psalm of David. David's perhaps thinking about his situation, maybe with Saul, pressure against him, but in this psalm we can see the one who is the greater David, I want to put it that way, the one who is of David's line, our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 19, but my foes are vigorous, they are mighty, and many are those who hate me wrongfully. Those who render me evil for good accuse me because I follow after good. It's a scripture that speaks straight into Jesus' trial. I'd never seen that before. And you know what? There are 300 plus prophecies of Jesus' first coming in scripture. And you know what? Everyone has been fulfilled 
perfectly. If you doubt the truth of the Bible, that is a very powerful evidence that the Bible is true. And we can have confidence, can we not, that because the first coming prophecies have been fulfilled, that those about Jesus' second coming will also be fulfilled. And so then we move on to the high priest's leading question. Verse 61. And he asks this, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? very sad I think in just listening to that and reading that it's quite ironic that the Jews wouldn't say the name of God because they considered his name was too holy to even say out loud so the high priest thought not to sin as he saw it by referring to God but it was a man-made rule he sought not to sin with his lips but his heart was full of anger and hatred and bitterness and evil desires towards Jesus who is God in the flesh and who was there standing before him. What his mouth spoke, his heart didn't agree with. And we too, brothers and sisters, we have to guard our hearts. The Bible says in Proverbs, from, from our hearts flows the wellspring of life. God's the one who looks and sees our hearts. But we need to have hearts and mouths, as it were, that are in accord. What we feeling in our hearts. We need to be able to speak that with our lips. There needs to be a connection there, not a disconnect. We need to be speaking truth. May my heart attitude be reflected in the things that I say. And Jesus then, in verse 62, finally answers. First time he speaks in this trial. And what does he do? He affirms the truth. He's speaking the truth. Because what does he say? Yes, I am. I am he. Yes, I am the Christ. And he says a bit more. He says, you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. Jesus again is speaking and using the scriptures to affirm who he is. The scriptures that the members of the Jewish council and the high priest should have known so well. Well, in a sense, they did know it well in their heads, but they knew the words and not the meaning. They didn't have the understanding. Jesus had said to them earlier in his ministry, all the scriptures bear witness to me. They point to me, to my coming. But we read, and this is in John 5, 39, and 40, but they refuse to turn to Jesus. They refuse to believe in Jesus and so chose not to enter into and receive the gift of eternal life. In the passage you just read, Jesus is referring specifically to um, Psalm 110 and uh, another passage in Daniel, and they're both messianic prophecies that point not to Jesus' first coming, but to his future fulfillment of prophecy in his second coming in glory that he's going to come to rule he's come to reign establish his millennial kingdom and so we have two ways that prophecy is fulfilled in this passage jesus fulfills at that time the prophecy of being silent but also affirms his future fulfillment of prophecy to come in his second coming. And you will see, he says, he's referring to those alive on the earth at the time of his second coming, they will physically see Jesus coming in his full glory with the clouds of glory, the clouds of heaven. Jesus is seated now at the Father's right hand. But one day he will come back again and establish his rule and reign upon the earth. 
but not just those who are alive at that time will see Jesus. One day, everyone will see Jesus in his glory. The high priest and the members of the council who heard Jesus say that, and the false witnesses who were there at that trial, they will see and appear before Jesus in his glory. You and I and everyone will appear before Jesus in his glory. And when we appear before Jesus in his glory, we will appear before him in two ways. Either there's those who have accepted him as our saviour and Lord, or for those who have not, we will appear before him as our judge. One day, the Bible affirms to us that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Where do you stand before Jesus today? We cannot save ourselves. We cannot make ourselves good enough for heaven. We're not, we're sinners. That's why Jesus came and went to the cross. Have you accepted Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior here today? If you're at home or if you're listening to this at some point in time in the future. If you have not, and you choose not, and you resist Jesus through this life and never turn to him, then you will appear before Jesus as your judge and the verdict will be, depart from me, I knew you not. And the destiny is the lake of fire and sulfur. I urge you to turn to Jesus today, to trust him, to repent of your sin. The moment you do that and receive him as saviour and make him lord of your life, then when you meet Jesus, he will say to you, welcome home, good and faithful servant. Come with me into my eternal kingdom. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. Don't put that off. If God's speaking to you here today, don't put it off. You don't know what tomorrow will hold, what the next five minutes will hold. And then we move on. In verses 63 and 64, we see the reaction to what Jesus has said from the high priest and the council's decision. The high priest tore his garments and said, what further witnesses do we need? You have heard this blasphemy. What is your decision? And they all condemned him as deserving of death. I believe this is a, a false piety, a false show that the high priest puts on they had wanted Jesus to be put to death. They believed that they'd secured the response from Jesus, affirming the truth of who he is, that he is the Christ, that they had desired, because they wanted to twist that and define it as blasphemy, speaking slanderously, untruthfully, evilly, mockingly of God. Blasphemy was a charge that had with it the death sentence. Leviticus 24, 16, it was the death penalty for blaspheming the name of the Lord. And it says that all of them present, they should have had that chance of individually coming and giving their verdict, but we read earlier and thought earlier about they all come together as one. Again, this is another reason why it was illegal. And they say he is deserving of death. But I would say it's possibly all who were present deserving, who said he was deserving of death. I think it's quite possible that Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea were not present at this illegal gathering, this illegal trial. Because we can read in Luke 23, verses 15 and 51, that Joseph of Arimathea did not consent to their decision and action. We know that Jesus had met Nicodemus secretly at night, that Nicodemus, we believe, was a secret follower of Jesus, and quite possibly Joseph too. They loved Jesus. They sought to stand and speak up for Jesus. They're actually the ones who go to Pilate and ask to take Jesus' body down from the cross at a risk to themselves for doing so. But they were only two out of what would have been 71 if a full council was their members. In a sense, they made a stand, and they stood against the crowd. Two out of 71. But that's us, isn't it, too? There'll be times 
as believers, when we will face situations where we are tempted to stand with the crowd rather than stand for Jesus. All of us at one time stood with the crowd before we came to faith in Jesus. But there will be times where there's great pressure on us to go the way of the world rather than to go the way that Jesus would have us go. That might be at work. It might be at college. It might be in your family, among your neighbours. It might be through a hobby or an activity that you do. There will come pressure at times to go the way of the world, to perhaps watch the thing you know you should not be watching on TV, to look at the thing on the internet you know you should not be looking at, to take, as it were, drugs that you know you should not be taking, to maybe drink to a level that is not right, and you know it's not. You know the things that you face, the pressure that is put upon you to go and conform to the standards of the world. But the wonderful thing is that when we ask God to enable us to stand firm for Jesus, he will certainly enable us to do so. It won't be easy. Perhaps we will lose friends in university commas, but he will enable us to stand. One plus God is a majority. And so, as we come to the close of this passage, we look at the last verse, verse 65, where the hatred and the anger against Jesus actually overspills into physical violence. Some spat on Jesus. That was the most contemptible thing a Jew could have done to another person. They covered his face. That's indicative of their desire for him to face the death penalty, even though it would require the Romans to sanction it. And some struck Jesus, saying, mocking him, prophesy. I tell us the name of the person who struck you. But again, this is a profound truth that their very actions, again, are in the Old Testament. They are part of Old Testament prophecy. Isaiah 50, verse 6 and verse 7 This was prophesied. This is exactly what happens. And it's fulfilled in Jesus. I gave my back to those who strike and my cheeks to those who pull out the beard. I hid not my face from disgrace and spitting. But then there's a change of note. But the Lord God helps me. Therefore I have not been disgraced. Therefore I have set my face like a flint and I know that I shall not be put to shame. Throughout his time on earth, Jesus entrusted himself to his Father's love, care and will. He gave himself completely. He did what the Father gave him to do. He spoke what the Father Gave him to speak. What were his words? Not my will, but thy will be done. Knowing that the trial was to come. Knowing that the cross awaited. We read in the scriptures that Jesus set his flint to go to Jerusalem to accomplish the work the Father gave him to do. But he set his face like flint, I believe, to do what the Father gave him to do all his life. Not just at his trial. Not just as he was nailed to the cross. For my sin. And for your sin. And although at his trial it might have seemed as if Jesus had been put to shame, that was emphatically not the case, was it, brothers and sisters? Because he didn't stay in the grave. On the third day, the Father gloriously raised him from death to life, affirming his complete acceptance and that the work that Jesus had done and had come to do was sufficient to deal with the problem of our sin. 
that Jesus had done all that was necessary to procure the way for my salvation, for your salvation, we have to simply respond. Just to finish, we thought about what our testimony for Jesus might be. We recognise we need to speak the truth and guard against gossip. We recognise that we need to entrust our lives to the Father. We've learned that the Bible, and have that reaffirmed, that the Bible is truth through the prophecies that have been fulfilled already and those that will be fulfilled. We know we need to speak the truth from our hearts. And one day we will all meet Jesus as our saviour or as our judge. We know that we need to stand out from the crowd and speak out for Jesus. Not in our own strength, but by God's grace. So let us, brothers and sisters, follow the example that Jesus has set before us. And as we go out into this week, let us speak and act and live out our lives in such a way that as people look at us, they would see Jesus in us. And for his glory, declare that he or she is a follower of Jesus Christ. Amen. <laughs>